Visual Design Elements, Part 1. I'm Dr. Katherine Fulford at the University of Hawaii. The first major model for communication was used to explain the human communication process. It was developed in 1949 by Shannon and Weaver and has been used ever since and elaborated on. The idea was that communication is a process of sending and receiving messages or transferring information from a sender to a receiver. The model was originally designed to mirror the functioning of radio and telephone technologies. The idea is that there's an information source, like a person, which produces a message. There is a transmitter which encodes the message into a channel, and signals are adapted for transmission by a receiver, which decodes the message from the signal and then the destination where the message arrives, another human being. Later, it was hypothesized that the design of the media and its characteristics, that noise interferes with the clarity and the meaning of the message. In 1991, Cosma found that when learning with media, that media has an effect on the learning process. Characteristics of a medium affect the constructive processes by which learners create new knowledge and that media with different characteristics can actually create different learning. A virtual medium is created by the particular characteristics of a medium used in a session. In 1992, I started to research this theory and looked at two-way communication. What I discovered is that we have enough room in our brain to both speak and listen to another person in a two-way communication at about 125 to 150 words per minute. That's the rate at which we speak and listen. However, there's some remaining space in our brain to both monitor to make sure we don't say anything silly, as well as to prepare our response. Again, at 125 to 150 words per minute. The total brain capacity being 250 to 300 words per minute. I hypothesized that this was the rate at which we could comprehend compressed speech. My research seemed to indicate that this was the case. Since speed reading was also at the same rate, I concluded that there may be a cognitive speed at which we can listen, prepare, as well as read. It's interesting when we think about this in terms of one-way communication. If we're listening to a lecture, we can listen at about 125 to 150 words per minute. That leaves a leftover amount for internal conversation, again at about 125 words per minute. The problem is, as we start to listen, we may find ourselves getting distracted saying how I wonder it relates to something, or being fascinated and finding yourself off on another bent. Or you may just be bored and wonder what you might cook for dinner tonight. Sometimes students may find themselves bored, frustrated, confused, or distracted in these one-way situations. Research on trust and believability for training shows that the visual accounts for 55% of the whole, whereas the vocal quality accounts for 38%, and the words that you say are only 7% of the whole. So, how I look at 55% is really critical, and that has a lot to do with the images that you choose to use. How I sound is really critical, and it means that we need to think seriously about our delivery. What I say is also important because it does make up the whole, and it's the important part of the message. So visual ideas have become very important. Using visuals means using pictures of people or things 
not just pictures of words. Graphic style. Graphic styles come and go. This is a good one, but in this day and age, photographs are usually better. Now I'm going to talk about design elements. These are basic strategies for creating successful visual compositions. First is simplicity. Whenever you use slides or any medium that goes in sequence, it's best to put a single concept in a single area or on a single page. You want to avoid bulky frames, borders, and boxes. Avoid putting things in corners that clutter the page. Avoid busy backgrounds. Unity is another important concept. Does this look unified? Clearly not. How about if we add the definition? That all parts of a visual are tied together through overlapping spacing, lines, color, texture, shape, or focus. But our visual still is not unified. Let's see what we can do to improve it. Now we've pulled the pieces closer together so it looks much more like a single picture. But by adding a frame around it or a background, we've unified it even more. Balance. We have two types of balance. Formal balance that is symmetrical and informal balance that is asymmetrical. When we look at this one, the formal balance, we find that it has a predetermined order. It's concise, but it's a little bit mechanical. To achieve formal balance, we use objects in even numbers. Informal balance, on the other hand, is seemingly random, is a little bit less precise. We use our eye to balance the objects, but it's a lot more interesting and dynamic. We use odd numbers of objects to achieve informal balance. Center of interest and focal point are another idea. If we look at this gentleman, he is pointing off of the screen, not towards our center of interest. So this is not the focal point. However, if we move him to the other side of the screen, it does show our center of interest. So this achieves our focal point. Emphasis is also another idea. You can use some outstanding feature to direct your eye. We can also use emphasis in other ways. For example, we can use boxes, highlighting, color, symbols, and sounds for emphasis. We can also use bold, underline, and italics, but we need to do this judiciously or they don't work. Always emphasize negatives such as not, and emphasize absolutes like must. Color, what a wonderful thing. Research has shown that color is highly motivational. It helps us symbolize concepts. It helps direct our attention. It helps us motivate. And it helps us create a mood, as well as solidify a theme. Some colors work better than others. You need to be aware of your medium. For example, white or yellow on blue is best for projections in large rooms. But red or black on dark blue can often be hard to read. So you need to think about your contrast when choosing colors. You can use contrast to illustrate differences, but do be careful of red and green for the colorblind. You can also use contrast in pictures, emphasizing things like young and old, differences between places, and differences between things. You can use shape 
to help you reflect a theme, to create interest, to add dynamics, and to help move your eye. Texture can be beautiful and used to replace the sense of touch. That's all for now. I'll see you in part two.